The parable of the ten virgins has been the basis for countless sermons over the centuries. It is the story of the bride being ready to meet the bridegroom. Central to the story are ten virgins, five who are identified as wise and five as foolish. For the most part, theologians and preachers and teachers have identified the wise as the church and the foolish as the lost. If you were to break down the commentary and the sermons that have been preached on this subject, you would most likely detect two key points. Number one, Yeshua, Jesus, is coming in an hour when you least expect it. And number two, you better have believed in Jesus and prayed some semblance of the sinner's prayer by asking him into your heart. Now let me ask you, Do you really believe this is what Yeshua was teaching when he spoke this parable? The parable of the ten virgins is found in the book of Matthew. It states, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry, a shout that was made. Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all of the virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go you rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other version, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. There are similarities between the five that are wise and the five that are foolish that should not be overlooked. Note, if you will, that all were virgins. All had lamps. All were waiting for the appearing of the bridegroom. And it must have been a long time that had lapsed because all became drowsy and fell asleep. And all were awakened by a shout declaring, The bridegroom is approaching. Come out to meet him. With respect to the foolish virgins, notice their lamps all went out. They took no oil with them. Their last-minute excursion to purchase additional oil separated them from the five wise virgins who were prepared. By the time they got back, the bridegroom and the wedding party had already departed, literally leaving them behind. In order to understand this parable, we need to ask three important questions. What is the significance of the number 10? And what makes five of the virgins wise? And what makes the other five foolish? With regard to the number 10, let me ask you a question. What is the first thing that comes to your mind? Would it not be the Ten Commandments? Hased Deviot, the Ten Words. We call it the Ten Commandments, the Law, the Covenant of Marriage. 
In Deuteronomy chapter 4, we find these words, And he declared unto you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform, even ten commandments, and he wrote them upon two tables of stone. Most people do not even realize that the Ten Commandments is the foundational document of just and right government. They represent all that a society needs in order to live in harmony and in peace. Therefore, Ten is considered the numerical symbol of creation's responsibility to both hear and obey the eternal law of Elohim. In Psalms 119, David said that your word, the law, is a lamp for my feet, a lamp for my path. In the book of Proverbs, we find these words, For a commandment of the law is a lamp and a light, and the way of life is reproof and instruction. Now let's consider those last two verses in comparison with Yeshua's words that he spoke at the Sermon on the Mount. Ye are the light of the world, which is the visible manifestation of the law. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. And these are the good works of the law. And glorify your Father which is in heaven. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I'm not come to destroy, but to fulfill, which means to observe it faithfully. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled, observed faithfully. Whosoever, therefore, shall break one of these least commandments, and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Now let's consider what Scripture says about the ones that are considered wise. In the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 4, we find these words, I have taught you laws and ordinances. Keep them and do them, for that will be your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples, who, when they hear of these laws, will say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. In Psalms 19, it states, The law of Yahweh is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of Yahweh is sure, making wise the simple. In Psalms 119, it states, Thou through thy commandments hast made me wiser than my enemies, for they, the commandments, are ever with me. In chapter 3 of the book of James, he asked, Who is wise and endued with learning among you? Let him show the works, the works of the law, of his good, pure, and moral behavior, in meekness that is coupled with wisdom. Okay, now let's look at what Scripture says about the ones that are considered foolish. Keep in mind that the foolish virgins brought no oil with them. Throughout Scripture, oil represents the spirit of Elohim, moving, bearing fruit, and producing good works. For example, in Zechariah chapter 4, the Holy Spirit appears not in pure form, the essence of Elohim's mind and power, but rather in the form of oil that flows through His servants. Now that we understand that oil is a representation of the Holy Spirit, let's look at a remark that was made by Paul when he wrote to the Thessalonians. Quench not the Spirit. In the Gospel of John, 
We are told that the work of the Holy Spirit is to convict the world of, get this, sin, the transgression of the law. Number two, Elohim's righteousness, which is manifest in the law. And number three, coming judgment of sinners and transgressors of the law. By implication, Paul in his letter to the Thessalonians is asserting that a believer can foolishly choke, hold back, extinguish, stifle, suppress, quench the spirit of Elohim. Paul in his letter to the Romans writes, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. That is foolish. But they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. That is wise. For to be carnally minded is death. That is foolish. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. That is wise. Paul goes on to state, Because the carnal mind is enmity against Elohim. For it is not subject to the law of Elohim, and neither indeed can it be. So then, they that are in the flesh cannot please Elohim. What I'm about to share with you may come as a great surprise. Most people are unaware that when reading the Bible, they are often confronted with what is known as ellipsis. Ellipsis is the omission from speech or writing of a word or words that are superfluous or able to be understood from contextual clues. An understanding of ellipsis will help unlock a secret that is located in Romans 8, 7. The carnal mind is enmity against Elohim, for it is not subject to the law of Elohim. Paul is emphatically stating that the carnal-minded are not subject to the law of Elohim. Thus, by ellipsis, he is insinuating the spiritually-minded are the ones who subject themselves to the law. Let me be very clear. There is reward for those that are wise, and there is ramification for those that are foolish. When the people stood at the foot of Mount Sinai, they heard Elohim make a promise. He stated, If you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession above all peoples. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. Now contrast that promise with the warning made by Yeshua when he stated, Watch ye therefore and pray always, that you may be accounted worthy to escape all the things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Now let's put this business of reward and ramification into context. In the book of Revelation chapter 2 and 3, John is commanded to write the seven assemblies, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardia, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Immediately after being told to write to the seven assemblies, John tells us what happens next. Beginning in chapter 4, he states, And behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. Then he says, Around the throne were twenty-four thrones, and on the thrones I saw twenty-four elders sitting, clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. Then he goes on to say, Thou wast slain and has redeemed us to Elohim by thy blood, out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and has made us unto Elohim a kingdom of priests, and we shall reign upon the earth. One cannot help but notice the striking resemblance between what John wrote and what Paul wrote in his letter to the Thessalonians when he stated, For the Lord himself 
will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds and meet the Lord in the air. In Paul's letter to the Thessalonians, he states that there is a voice of an archangel. In Revelation chapter 4, John states there is a voice. Then Paul states that there is a sound of a trumpet. John says there is a sound of a trumpet. Then Paul goes on to reiterate the promise of being caught up. John states he heard a call to come up. Surely this is not a coincidence. I believe that the evidence is clear. The 24 elders represent the 24 divisions of the biblical priesthood as set forth in 1 Chronicles chapter 24. It is the fulfillment of the promise made by Elohim at Mount Sinai. If you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure unto me above all people. But wait just a moment. What about the virgins that were foolish? The book of Revelation, chapter 7, speaks of a time when a great host of people are redeemed and standing before Elohim. And the elders are asking, Who are these? And the voice replies, These are they that came out of the great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. They are before the throne of Elohim and do service to him day and night in his temple. And he that setteth upon the throne shall shelter over them. Notice, if you will, there is a great distinction between those who are redeemed during the great tribulation and the 24 elders who are in heaven before the tribulation starts. The 24 elders, it says, will reign and rule with Messiah. These that come out of the great tribulation are servants. Now, you may be asking yourself, why will the foolish virgins be left behind to endure tribulation? The answer to that question is found in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 30. When you are in tribulation, and all these things come upon you in the latter days, you will return to Yahweh your Elohim and obey His voice, the law, His covenant. It is unfortunate, but the Bible says that fools despise wisdom and instruction. If I am right, what we call the church is going to be in for a real rude awakening.